Great. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. Could you um, please introduce yourself to um, Rope.net? Just say a word about who you are, what, what you're doing in Oxford and some of the activism that you've been involved in. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. It really is a privilege and an honour uh, to be able to share uh, my experiences and thoughts with the readership uh, of the Review of the African Political Economy. My name is Simukai Chiguru, I come from Zimbabwe, and I'm here studying at the University of Oxford, where I'm pursuing a PhD in international development. My academic work focuses on the politics of a catastrophic cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe in 2008 and 2009. Mm -hmm. More particularly, I, um, with, with respect to today's discussion, um, I've been involved in the Rose Must Fall movement at Oxford University and uh, look forward to sharing my insights about that. Fantastic. So let's, let's move on. Can you talk about the origins of the Rhodes Must Fall movement in Oxford, how it reflects what was taking place in South Africa last year and how you see its development? Well, as I think is now a well-known story, uh, Rhodes Must Fall uh, within South Africa as it began um, in around March last year really captured uh, a global imagination raising questions about the role and purpose of the university um, as a site of learning and instruction, but also as a site of being and belonging, where ideas and received wisdom about where knowledge is produced and who has the right to impart it were brought into question, particularly to the extent that many of our elite institutions, be they in Africa or in the West, are often reflected uh, within the image uh, of historical figures and actors um, that held very uh, often racist, uh, imperialist kinds of views. Uh, Rhodes, must, Rhodes uh, Cecil John Rhodes is emblematic um, of that particular imagination and that particular historical era. South African students bravely challenged that. Now this resonated deeply within Oxford. Oxford University is uh, linked to South Africa, is linked to the African continent uh, in multiple ways. Contemporarily, we see a range of students from Africa who come to study at Oxford. Uh, we see a range of students from Southern Africa who come and study as graduate students in Oxford on the Rhodes Scholarship and on a host of other scholarships, pursuing programs of study with direct bearing to Africa's political and social uh, and economic concerns, African studies, development studies, to name just a couple of examples. So, we can also trace this relationship back in time. Uh, Cecil John Rhodes, the mining magnate, uh, governor of the Cape Colony, an ardent imperialist, was himself the product of an Oxford education. Uh, his mission to build a highway from the Cape to Cairo, to um, exploit and extract resources from the African continent, to remake it very much in the image of British imperialism and the Anglo-Saxon race is testament not only to the hubris of an individual man, uh, but to the power of an institution and uh, a government that sought to, in a manner of speaking, take over the world. These legacies live on in a range of different ways. Um, Oxford is certainly strewn with uh, any number of tributes to the great men of empire. Um, these histories are often presented without subtlety, uh, without reflection of the darker sides of their history, the lives lost, the labor exploited, um, the languages, cultures, traditions that were violently disrupted. So when South African students began to campaign around the figure of Rhodes to raise questions about the university, uh, it seemed to us in Oxford um, that such questions were as pertinent in this part of the world as they are within Africa. Now if I can be a bit more specific about how this actually came about. A number of us 
um, graduate students and undergraduate students have been debating and thinking about questions of race and identity. Uh, at Oxford, we've been talking about questions around the historical legacies of slavery and colonialism. This has taken place in a range of formal and informal settings. Uh, I, for example, participated in a radical political theory uh, reading group. Uh, there were opportunities to debate some of these things more formally within spaces like the Oxford Union. Um, as such, a network that was quite diffuse through the university um, was concerned with a range of these kinds of uh, political and social ideas. We were following quite keenly what was happening within South Africa. And then following the lead of South African students who were here, many of whom had studied in Cape Town, we decided to begin by expressing our solidarity for the movements in South Africa. And this is what, April, May last year? So this actually started in late March last year. The very first action that was taken by um, students in Oxford in the name of Rhodes Must Fall was to post a picture um, underneath the statue of Cecil John Rhodes that sits on a very prominent street uh, in Oxford known as High Street. Uh, the statue is on the outward facing edifice of Oriel College. Underneath that, students draped a sheet uh, that said, decolonize education, roads must fall. And a number of mostly black students, but other students of color stand underneath it with their fists raised high in solidarity with students of Cape Town. This image was then disseminated across Facebook and Twitter, as well as emailed directly to colleagues in South, uh, in South Africa. A number of statements were written expressing our admiration for the activism taking place and saying that we, we as a collective, um, stood in unequivocal um, solidarity and support for this movement, recognizing its urgency. Um, what subsequently happened is over the next few months, particularly after the statue was successfully removed from the Cape Town campus, um, we started to talk increasingly of what such a movement might look like in, uh, in Oxford. And, you know, to paraphrase uh, William Shakespeare, uh, there was indeed a tide in the affairs of, May, of, of men that needed to be taken on high um, to start to bring about the kinds of change that we were interested in. Um, so within the summer months, so this is around May and June uh, of last year, 2015, um, we began starting to spread, uh, to use the hashtag, sorry, roads must fall, when we were tweeting, we began to point out various images uh, in Oxford that were indicative of its colonial history that was uncritically celebrated. We began to raise questions about the represent or the lack of representation uh, in a substantial way of black and other minority ethnics in the professoriate of the faculty. Um, all of this was given great impetus when a scandal broke out um, at the Oxford Union Debating Society. Uh, on this occasion, this was in May, um, the Oxford Union had published a flyer. The flyer contained the image of black hands in shackles. The context of the flyer was that the union was promoting a drink within its bar called the Colonial Comeback. This was supposed to be a thematic drink to dovetail with the debate that it was having about colonialism. Now this shows you the callous um, historical imagination that sees such images as a mere relic without recognizing their living history for many students within the university, as well as for the experiences of multiple peoples who have been uh, subjected to various kinds of oppression throughout history, but particularly those concerned with slavery and colonialism. Um, we challenged this forcefully um, and loudly. We received press coverage um, over um, our publicizing of this fly and pointing out the kind of structural racism that goes in to deciding on this theme of a cocktail, creating a flyer, printing it off, disseminating it without at any point stopping to ask uh, or to question why this, was, uh, why this was happening or to explore whether or not it was appropriate. Um, after that, um, we decided to convene a meeting of students from across the university um, who had experienced prejudice, discrimination, marginality in any form. Um, this led to the first General Assembly in which we were formally inaugurated as a collective of students called Roads Must Fall. Students from South Africa Skyped in, 
um, and let an Amandla Awetu chant. Um, and people talked about questions around race, around gender and sexuality, uh, around class, and talked about the multiple ways in which Oxford can create various kinds of hierarchies amongst its students, where privilege and elitism map onto the identities of some students and not others. Um, we also talked about how this seeps into the classroom. What does it mean, for instance, when you study philosophy, but all the scholars you learn and read from are dead white men? It lets, leads us to ask, can women think? Can people of colour think? Do they have any philosophical insight into their circumstances or their condition, or indeed into the world at large? So, with these kinds of questions in mind, the movement began to cohere around three key pillars. The first pillar, as I've alluded to, relates to this question of iconography. Who do we celebrate in public space? Why attribute, for instance, to Rhodes with no recognition of his actions within Southern Africa? The other question we raised was representation. Why are the rates of admission of black and other minority ethnic students well below the UK's national average? The third question we, we were asking um, related to the curriculum. Whose thought, what epistemologies, what lines of scholarship do we privilege when we set a core curriculum, when we deem certain works of literature to be canonical, when we decide that only European languages can be considered modern? These were the kinds of questions that began to brew and to emerge at this time. Fascinating. No, I, I, I've only got my eye on the time, and I just quickly wanted to move on, and I'm sure you were about to touch on that, mm. the, the reaction to the movement. Can you, can you say something about how um, intellectuals, commentators, mm -hmm. the media received this emerging movement in the heart of its um, privileged mm. um, university system? Absolutely. Um, so things really uh, came um, to life around uh, the 6th of November 2015. Strangely enough, or I was actually in Zimbabwe conducting research for my doctorate and was following these events very closely on Twitter. What happened was about 300 students, thereabouts, uh, went and occupied the square outside Oriel College and presented a petition to um, the provost and uh, deputy director of the college. Uh, the petition called for the removal of the Rhodes statue and the plaque uh, that was erected to celebrate his donation to the college. Um, it was signed by over 2,000 students and staff uh, pointing out the corrupt historical legacies by which Rhodes's money was acquired and fed into the university. Um, Shortly thereafter, it was national news. It was covered all over the UK's national press, but also into the international press within Africa, parts of Europe and the United States. Uh, and it wasn't long thereafter that there was a backlash. The backlash was precipitated when Oriel College, in response to this petition, said that it was going to seriously consider removing the statue after a consultative process that it was going to begin uh, in February the following year to last six months. So within this interim, between the petition being presented, Oriel College responding in a positive way, but not in a definitive way, um, various commentators started to share their views. I'd like to share a few examples with you to really drive home the point. The first and perhaps uh, most immediately jarring one was presented by a conservative politician and member of European Parliament uh, called Daniel Hannan, who has recently uh, acquired some degree of fame or notoriety um, over his uh, uh, adamant uh, pursuance of the Brexit vote. Uh, Mr. Hannan wrote that Rhodes Must Fall is a cretinous mob that is too dim to be at university. Uh, this was followed shortly thereafter by comments um, from ostensibly left-wing intellectuals. Here I'm thinking of Will Hutton, who is the principal of Hartford College at Oxford. He wrote that if it were not for British colonialism, 
South Africa would descend into unaccountable despotism. Uh, he went That's on, astonishing. I, I didn't know that. Absolutely, yeah. And he said this was embodied by Jacob Zuma. Uh, whatever criticisms one might have of the current ANC government or Jacob Zuma, one must be familiar with South African history before making such a charge. He went on to say that British colonialism had bequeathed South Africa with democracy, the rule of law, constitutionalism, and my personal favourite, freedom of association. Or at least he didn't use the word civilization. <laughs> yeah, indeed. But one would still want to ask Mr. Hutton what history books he's been reading that led him to think that apartheid in any way entailed freedom of association. Um, another left-wing intellectual is the Cambridge professor Mary Beard, who is a celebrated classicist noted for her writings on the Roman Empire, who said that Rhodes Must Fall students needed to be empowered to walk past the statue uh, without wishing to bring it down. Uh, one might, must ask why her conception of empowerment should in any way be normative or ubiquitous. Uh, but very crucially were the comments made by the, the, the new vice chancellor of this university who took her tenure in January um, this year, 2016, who said that removing the statue was tantamount to historical erasure. Uh, and similarly, the Chancellor of the University, uh, Chris Patton, the former colonial governor of Hong Kong, was even more incendiary when he said that students who don't like roads should consider being educated elsewhere. If that was not enough, he went on to add that Rhodes Must Fall students were too sensitive and were not prepared to tolerate views um, that were um, jarring to them, and that if they were so opposed to freedom of speech, they should consider going to China. Now, I don't need to point out the absurdity of these remarks. In what way does challenging um, what a statue represents tantamount to shutting down freedom of speech? This, in my view, showed the fear um, of the establishment, um, its ingrained sense of British nationalism and entitlement that was not prepared to turn the critical gaze in on itself and to listen to the criticisms being proffered by us as activists, to seriously consider the questions that we're asking of this university. Instead, we were demonized and dismissed within those maneuvers. Okay, now what, what I'm going to do is conduct this interview in two parts. Okay. So this is, this is the uh, very interesting end of the first part of the interview. Okay. The next will resume shortly.